Hello everyone. So today we're gonna talk about proteins, and I'll probably continue into nucleic acids as well. Instead of making two videos, I'll just make one. Um, they're not really long, so let's get going. So we've talked about carbohydrates. We've talked about lipids. Now we're gonna get into proteins. Proteins have many, 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 many different functions, and they are super important. We're all made up of a lot, a lot of proteins. When one of the proteins or some of the proteins in our body don't work. We got huge problems with, with so many things. So we're going to talk about uh, the main categories of proteins and briefly just give a quick definition of each one. And then we'll jump into the, the structure of a protein and then um, the, the levels of, of, of protein uh, folding. Okay, so we'll start with uh, enzymes. Okay, so that's the first one. We'll, we'll number them. We'll put some numbers in here, make it nice and pretty. Okay, um, so we got enzymes. So enzymes are really helpful in chemical reactions. Um, enzymes are little proteins that really help uh, with with so many things um, in breaking stuff down and in initiating uh, ongoing chemical reactions and helping. Um, uh, us digest the food. We got digestive enzymes. We got enzymes that can break down bonds. We got enzymes that just do so many things. Um, so mainly enzymes, um, there are catalysts. Okay, and also um, let me put this down here like that. So enzymes are catalysts, and they reduce the number or the amount of energy um, input to start a reaction. Okay, so every time we're going to have a, a chemical reaction inside our body, every time we're going to do something, these enzymes go ahead and help those reactions. Um, think about hydrolysis, think about dehydration reactions. So these enzymes are really those those helpful little little proteins um, that, that reduce the amount of energy needed to start a reaction by them lending in a little helping hand. Okay, um, so this image is just a general overview of every single one. Um, so we'll go specifically into each one. Okay, um, so they reduce the amount of energy. Um, also, selective acceleration. So that just means um, they help um, accelerate all of these reactions. Okay, so we got an example: digestive enzymes. Um, digestive enzymes. So remember the hydrolysis, mm. or the dehydration is when we release water and bond them. Hydrolysis is breaking down um, those bonds. Um, so then these digestive enzymes help that out. Okay. So now let's jump to number two. We have defensive proteins. Okay. So defensive proteins. Um, the word, a lot of these, the name itself is really going to dictate uh, how these proteins behave or, or what function they have. Okay, so these defensive proteins, um, they are protection against disease. Okay, um, it's when we can get our antibodies. Okay, um, it's when we we need a lot of those antibodies uh, for viruses and, and bacteria. So hopefully we can make some vaccine soon for this coronavirus. But this is where our defensive proteins really come into play, uh, protecting us against any harm that can come from the outside. Okay? Anything that wants to take over our body, any viruses or any bacteria. So those are defensive proteins. Like I said, the word itself really dictates their, their function. We have storage proteins. Storage proteins. And the word again, they really store. So they store uh, amino acids. So they really store all the amino acids that we need. So remember, I don't know if you remember that chart, um, but our we have uh, monomers and polymers, right? So we have one or many. And our monomers for proteins are amino acids. Our polymers is a polypeptide chain. So a chain of amino acids, okay? So these storage proteins uh, really store all those amino acids 
So whenever we need to create any more proteins to create the body, um, that that's where we get all those amino acids from. So they're really like a little like a little warehouse inside. Okay, so they store amino acids. Um, so we got a couple examples here on the image: casein, uh, the protein of milk. Um, so it's really a big one for baby mammals when they're drinking milk. Um, plants have storage proteins in their seeds, and then we have a big one called ovalbumin. Ovalbumin. Okay, so this is an egg whites, um, and they think of that egg. I think of the egg white saying that it's so healthy and how you should only eat egg whites and not the yolk. My wife actually um, eats uh, only egg whites and uh, they have a lot of protein because they have their storage. So they have a lot of the, all those amino acids. Think about that egg white having everything needed to create a chicken or a little, or a little, yeah, like a little chicken. Um, so they have all those amino acids in there. That's why they're a, a rich source of protein. And it's really healthy to eat that egg white. So egg white, it's called ovalbumin. What's inside? Uh, what's in those egg whites? And that has that um, all those amino acids in there needed to create the embryo or to create the chicken. Okay, we have transport proteins. Again, transport proteins. What do they do? They transport materials through the cells, through our body, inside and outside, wherever things need to go. Okay, transport um, of, uh, of substances throughout the body. Okay, so they really transport things all across through the membranes. They can transport th things to different cells um, in different places. So, for example, we have hemoglobin transports uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide. To the cells and takes it to different places mm, so it takes that oxygen from the lungs to different parts so we're going to talk about uh, hemoglobin a little bit more later on and then uh, we have other proteins that are in the membrane so if you can see in this image right here um, you have the remember our phospholipid bilayer remember how phosphate and the lipid tail that we learned from the last video see how this all comes together and how they all work together um, and then you have a protein in the middle that lets certain things go through and, and not go through. So it really has little doors here, um, generally speaking, little doors that can let certain substances go inside the cell or leave the cell. Um, and so this is, it's actually, these are really, really important um, for many things. This is how we get uh, those contractions as well. Um, get those electrolytes, get our sodium, our calcium, our potassium through the, our muscles. We got all these little proteins that open channels and close channels to let things in and let things out. So those are our transport proteins. Okay. Um, then we have hormonal proteins. Okay. Uh, remember we talked about hormones. Um, we talked about estrogen and testosterone, but that's for lipids. Okay. Now we're going to talk about other hormonal proteins, um, such as insulin and. Uh, and glucagon, we remember from carbohydrates. So these proteins are the ones that are gonna regulate the carbs in our body or the sugar in our body and make sure we have a good uh, sugar levels. Okay, so we have uh, coordination of an organism's activity. We're really um, giving, keeping our levels of many different things at a standard or at a, at a pace where our body actually needs it okay so like we said uh, insulin can regulate our sugar levels so those are what those proteins are for now you know what happens with a lot of people who either don't have those types of proteins or those proteins don't work i mean things go crazy in our body by some of these proteins not working so we have insulin um control sugar levels okay organisms activity I need to work on my spelling. Um, okay, so we have here a little image, high blood sugar. We got into more here, secrete it, and uh, see if we can break it down. And we have normal or blood sugar levels in our body. Then we have uh, another example can be glucagon, which is just the opposite. Remember how when you have uh, sugar levels are too low, they go in there and they release them. 
so we have a higher um, sugar level. Okay. Then we have receptor proteins. Again, the word itself is going to dictate uh, the function. So these receptors, um, they combine specific molecules with each other, and they're really uh, mainly, um, we see those a lot in our brain synapses. So we have our connections in our brain, um, and then every time we send signals from our brain to other places, we have those proteins that, that receive those signals, so those receptors. So they receive those signals and take them to wherever they have to go. Um, okay, so they response. <clears throat> so these receptor proteins, um, response of the cell to the chemical stimuli. So these little receptor proteins are going to respond to the stimulus or to whatever sent or to whatever signal is being sent um, inside the, uh, in the brain or different parts of the body. Okay. So here's the example: receptors build into the membrane of a nerve cell, detect the signaling molecules released by the other nerve cells. So it's kind of like communication ones. Um, there, here's a little protein, and it sends them a note. It's kind of like those those pigeons or those birds that they used to use and send those messages to different places. Um, they receive the messages. Okay. So, for example, we can have it in synapses. <clears throat> That's another way. Right? Okay. And then we have contractile. Contractile proteins. Um, I'll put a word so I don't confuse. Contractile and motor protein. Okay. So these. Um, they're really for movement, mainly to contract uh, our muscles, um, to contract uh, yeah, our muscles in our body. So we have um, um, the movement proteins. Okay, so these proteins are gonna work um, by moving, and those are the ones that are gonna help us contract and flex, I got no muscles, but and those are the ones that are gonna be working at different times, contracting and releasing and contracting and releasing. Think about when you get a cramp, um, that contraction and it stays there until you actually those uh, um, those uh, transport proteins actually those um, receptor proteins are going to be in, in, in those in those membranes and then we're going to have to get that sodium get that potassium that's why I say eat a banana so you get some potassium so then if you're not and then they release um, the little teeth so we're gonna we may get into that a little bit later on but these are examples we got actin and uh, we have Myosin, okay. Um, so we have actin, myosin. And this is going to be an example for our muscles. How these proteins can help contract contract our muscles. <clears throat> okay. And we have uh, structural proteins. Again, the word itself. They are for support. For structure uh, of the cell or of the body, you know, of different parts of our body. So right here we have uh, examples of keratin is a protein of hair, so it gives hair its structure, uh, horns, feathers, skin appendages. Uh, insects and spiders use those so far as to make their cocoon. So they use that keratin, that protein gives them that that strength, that structure in it. Um, we have collagen and elastin proteins. Um, in our connective tissues as well. So we have, and I'll explain a little bit about collagen, but here's a protein itself. So here's our tissue, and here's the proteins in there. You can see it's a little complex. Uh, it's like each one, each color is a different protein, so it's like three different proteins in there, uh, bundled up in there. Um, that's how you create collagen. Okay. Yeah. Collagen, keratin. So they're meaning for structure, kind of like, remember that, um, that lipid that was for structure? Yeah, cellulose. I mean, all those um, those plants have cellulose in there and gives them their, their cell wall. <clears throat> all right, so uh, in general um, definition or definition of the, how can I say this, the stru chemical structure um, or of these proteins. Remember how we talked about um, how these carbs have a, a carbonyl group and a lot of OHs. Um, the lipids have a carboxyl group and a lot of H's. Um, so these proteins have um, going to have a carboxyl group 
and they're going to have an amino group and then they're going to have an R group or a side chain and we'll talk about those R groups later on um, so every single one is going to have these two but then what's going to differ is the R group so we got different types of R groups that have different functions Okay, and that's the one that's going to vary between those proteins. So every single protein is going to have your carboxyl, your amino, and an R group. So when you see that R group, that's when you're going to know, okay, that's a protein. So if I show you an image of, of like a chain or different things, you're going to notice the amino group, the carboxyl group, and an R. And uh, I'll show you some images in a little bit. Okay, so those are the main differences or the main characteristics of a protein, okay, of the chemical structure of that protein. So here we have... This may look overwhelming, but it's really not that complicated, okay? It's really, really, really simple. Um, okay, so we have uh, different R groups, okay? So if you remember, we have uh, the carboxyl group, the amino group, and this is the R, CH3. So one R has H, that's glycine. Another one has CH3, that's alanine. Another one has a chain of two CH3s and a CH, that's valine. So you see how the purple, it's all the same, we have a carbon in the middle, hydrogen, we have the carboxyl, the amino. Carbon, hydrogen, carboxyl, amino. Carbon, hydrogen, carboxyl, amino. Carboxyl, amino. So they all have those two. They just differ in the R group, okay, in the R group. So there's some that can be polar. There's some that can be nonpolar. There's some that can be neutral. There's some that can be slightly positive, slightly negative. So all those special characteristics of the R group is going to determine the shape and, and the function and the interaction with other um, proteins, okay? Um, so there we go. Um, here's just, there's like uh, 20 of them, the 20 main amino acids. Um, so these are the amino acids themselves. So once we combine all of these, we make a protein, which I'll explain to you in, in a little bit in the next couple of slides, okay? Um, so think about having all of these in a big chain, that's a whole protein. So each one of these are monomers, so maybe we should write that down. Uh, monomers are amino, amino acids. Okay. So I guess correctly term it is uh, we would have the amino acids. Uh, so proteins have these three groups, but it's mainly the, um, the chain of those. So it's mainly the amino acids that are going to have those three groups. Okay. Um, so I'm going to correct this um, just so I don't confuse you. Hopefully I did it already, um, but we have our amino acids here. We have a, with the carbox group, the amino group, and the R group, okay? Mm. Um, ah, let me zoom out a little bit. Okay. Um, so like I said, some of these are going to have, are going to be nonpolar, so our hydrophobic uh, amino acids. Some are going to be polar, and some are hydrophilic. Remember what polar and hydrophilic means? Water loving and nonpolar hydrophobic, water hating. So it's really going to um, define the way they're going to bend and how they're going to organize the protein itself based on, on their, their preference or based on their reaction to water. Okay. Um, we have some negatively charged, we have some positively charged, different types. Okay. So we're not going to get too specific on these and we will use these later on in the next couple of, of weeks when we talk about transcription and translation and, and all those things. Um, Okay, so now we're going to talk about the four uh, structures. Um, let me turn my page here a little bit. Um, called the four levels of uh, protein structure. Okay, so the four levels of protein structure. Maybe I can make this uh, bold so we don't lose these. Okay, take off the bowl now. So we're going to have um, primary structure. So what does this mean? Um, we combine all these monomers, or our body combines all these amino acids, and the combinations or the, the way they're going to be structuring itself, we have four names, um, four ways we name it, and we, we see uh, the protein. We can unfold it and see the different stages, you can say. Okay, so we have our primary structure. Um, and their primary structure is, is basically uh, the amino 
the amino acid sequence. That's our primary structure. It just contains the amino acid sequence. So remember, um, how we talked about here's your R group, here's your amino, here's your carboxyl, and uh, so here's one pro amino acid, there's another amino acid, there's another amino acid, another, so that's they just keep connecting and connecting and connecting until they make this big polypeptide chain, or this long chain, and that's going to be your protein. Okay, so this protein, the whole thing, its primary structure of the protein is just going to be the amino acid sequence. Uh, so glycine, proline, uh, thionine, uh, glycine again, so then uh, serine, lysine, cysteine. So it's just the structure, the sequence itself of amino acids. So that's our primary uh, structure, the amino acid sequence. Okay, then we get to our secondary structure. Secondary structure, let me get a little bit of in between these. Um, and that's just going to be two types of, of folding, you can say. We have alpha helix and beta uh, pleated sheet. Okay. <clears throat> so what's this, um, this is going to do is just the way these amino acids are going to fold or move or change or going to structure themselves depending if they're polar, if they're nonpolar, if they're negative, if they're positive. So uh, the sequence that we saw back here, this whole, all these little circles, um, they can kind of make a little alpha helix shape, so kind of this spiral going on. And you have all these lines, little hydrogen bonds that we have in here, all the little dots in there. Um, so in the middle, you can have, say, the nonpolar ones, the ones that hate water. So the outside, in case they interact with water, the water loving will be on the outside, and the ones that, that hate water, they'll be on the inside. So that's how they shape. And then we have the beta pleated sheet. So it's more of a linear structure instead of a folding of it, of the of the of the amino acids in here. So we have a beta strand and another beta strand, beta strand, and you have these little hydrogen bonds combining between them. So it's just really the, the shape is going to get alpha helix or beta pleated. So those are the two strands. And then we have the tertiary structure. Tertiary structure. Okay. And that's just going to be the 3D uh, shape. Or in other words, uh, the conformation. Um, a lot of these words, since I, I speak Spanish, it's easy to, for me to remember like the, uh, the word in Spanish and then relate it to it in English, but um, it's just really the whole shape. You see how in here you have a little alpha in here, and you have some beta pleated straight lines, a um, little bit of folding on the outside. So it's just a 3D structure, a 3D shape of the amino acid sequence or the polypeptide chain. Um, just put all proteins have the first three structures. Okay. Now there are some proteins that are gonna have the quaternary structure, or that's a fourth structure. Okay. So we're now we're gonna talk about quaternary structure. Okay. So all proteins have the first three. So all of them are gonna have amino acid sequence, you're going to have some alpha, some beta, and they're going to have a 3D shape. Now there's some proteins that are going to have various um, polypeptide chains combining with each other and creating a bigger structure or a bigger protein. So in this example, each color is a different one. So, so you're going to have a, a purple one, purple chain, and you have like a blue chain. Okay, so that's the quaternary structure. So it's bring more than one one polypeptide chain. Okay. Um, some examples, collagen, which has three polypeptide chains, and we have hemoglobin, which we talked about earlier, which has four um, polypeptide chains. Okay, so it's not all proteins are gonna have uh, different chains uh, linked together to creating a bigger protein, but some of them do. Okay, so everyone has the first three and some have more than, than that, which is a quaternary structure. Okay. So we're not going to get into detail. You just need to know um, the different structures that there are. Okay, so like I was saying here, as you can see some folding here inside, we have the, 
the hydrophobic ones and ones that really don't want to interact. Uh, you can have a folding somehow around it with a different protein uh, amino acid over here creates a bond with the amino acid over here. So it's really a lot of different ways um, the the amino acid sequence can really fold and, and shape itself. Um, here's collagen that we talked about. Each color is a different one, so it's a quaternary structure of collagen. Okay. We also have hemoglobin. Think about it. Look at all these um, that we have in here, um, transporting all of that oxygen and through the cells to the cells. Okay, so here's an image of. You think of like why why do I need to know all these uh, specific and so um, minuscule characteristics of of these uh, micromolecules or proteins? Um, more you in your nursing field. You're gonna talk. About, you're gonna see disease such as uh, sickle cell anemia, and so here's just one example you have on the left. Let me see if I can draw. I'm just gonna highlight her. So we have the primary structure over here. Remember, it's just the amino acid sequence. That's all it is. And then we can have the secondary and tertiary structure, which was the folding and the 3D shape of it. So here it is, just kind of the way it folds. The way it folds. Um, now you see the difference in the primary structure. What What is the difference in the primary structure? The main difference is going to be this one, number six over here. This one has GLU, this one has VAL. Okay, so one amino acid difference um, is going to create a complete chaos in the cell or the structure of the cell at the end. So, see how that one, instead of it folding kind of like a heart over here, a little bit romantic over here. Uh, it's kind of folded inside instead of to the outside. So the folding of the inside affects the shape of the blood cell. So now we have this uh, blood cell over here, a red blood cell. And this one's like a circle. It looks like a donut. And now we have over here the one that has that change in that sixth amino acid, which completely changed that folding on that chain, which completely changed the shape of the cell itself. So this cell over here, is really um, is really harmful uh, for us as the cell doesn't function properly and we have a lot of uh, you're gonna see in nursing a lot of hopefully not a lot of cases but you'll see cases of people with sickle cell anemia where they really can't transport um, all of the, the materials needed remember this um, hemoglobin is um, a type of transport protein okay so so just one little change creates all this chaos that's going on over here. Okay. Now, um, now we're going to talk about another term. It's called the denaturation. Okay. Um, so it really just means what denaturation stands for is a change in a change in um, the tertiary structure or a protein. That's denaturation, the change of the tertiary structure of the 3D shape of the protein. So a lot of times you can change that structure by altering different um, environments around that protein. Uh, by environments, I'm talking about um, changing the temperature, the pH, which we're going to do a lot this week on, or the salinity salt is present okay so by changing that you're gonna you can denature the protein so what does it mean to denature you really change the shape of it this is a correct or the normal shape of that protein when you denature it we change the temperature increase it decrease it change the pH change salinity you're just gonna I mean break it apart almost and unwind it and it's really not gonna work okay so um, Denatured proteins do not function correctly. Denatured proteins do not function correctly. Okay, so denaturing is really bad, really, really, really bad for proteins. So when you denature them, they're not going to work. Um, I see it as a, um, think about, I don't know, when someone's knitting and they have that nice little perfect circle and then and suddenly we denature it falls and it goes all over the place and then it untangles completely. And you're like, oh my gosh, and then you gotta tangle it again. Or a rope, imagine a rope just untangled all over it. It's really gonna, not 
not going to have the strength you need it to have. So that's basically what happens um, when you change the temperature, the pH of the salinity. salinity um, you're going to denature the proteins and they're not going to function correctly. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to do a brief little, um, brief, brief, brief um, comment into this or, or introduction into the cell and transcription and translation and how that works. So we have, here we have our cells. So let me see if I can draw. So say you have a cell on the outside. Our cell has a nucleus inside, okay, which is this blue or purple uh, circle in here. That's our nucleus. And then inside of it, we have our DNA, which is kind of like that. Okay, so that's our DNA, which is over here. Okay, so that's our DNA, and then our DNA is really the big, um, let's see, the cookbook, you can say, or, or it's kind of like, I always relate it to Spongebob, where it's that secret recipe for the Krabby Patties, so it's like super important, and you don't want it to leave the nucleus, it's really important, you don't want it to leave the nucleus, so what happens is we make a copy, or the synthesis of, of that DNA, or synthesize and create mRNA, okay? We're going to create an mRNA, and we'll talk about DNA and RNA, um, NA nucleic acids. That's what it stands for, and it's going to be our next topic right now. So create a copy, which is our mRNA. Now that copy can leave the nucleus. We don't care if the copy leaves. We don't want the original to leave. So the copy leaves the nucleus. Um, let me see if I can share this. Okay, so create a copy. The copy leaves, and now it's outside in the cytoplasm. Okay, so that copy has all the letters that we need to code to create all these proteins to create amino acids to then create these proteins, okay? So that's how that works. Um, this little, what's that protein called right here on the sides? Mm -hmm. Transport proteins here on the sides that are really um, letting things in, letting things out, okay? Now, um, once you have that RNA, then you're gonna start reading the letters. Remember how um, DNA, I don't know if you remember from high school, but DNA has letters like A, uh, T, C and G. So every single sequence of that letters is going to give you an amino acid, which is one of these little circles. And each amino acid is going to combine to create a specific protein. And each protein is going to go do its job in our body. Okay. So what happens is we have this copy here. There's this ribosome. It's also made up with proteins. And that's going to read, it's going to read the letters all those letters, it's going to read all those letters and start creating that chain. It's going to be like, oh, A, T, C, G, and then this is amino acid, or C, C, G, A, and then this one goes, and C, G, C, G, and then this one goes, and it's just going to create that chain, that chain, that chain that keeps on going to create um, that protein that we need. So that's really the basic um, of how this works, and each one of these is a very complex steps. Um, we got transcription, we got translation. So I just wanted to, to, to get into that. So now, I'm a little bit tired. Um, now we're gonna jump into nucleic acid. So feel free to take a break right now if you want. You can pause the video, take a little break, um, and you can continue watching this at a later time if you like. But I wanted to put it all in just one video. So we're gonna talk about nucleic acids. This is a good time to, to take a break if you need to. Um, Okay, so we have uh, what's called nucleic um, acids. Okay, so our nucleic acids are going to be made up of, um, if I can spell, made up of, we have a sugar, we have a phosphate, and we have a base. Called nitrogenous base because it contains nitrogen. So nitrogenous base, a sugar, a phosphate, and a base. So that's what makes up uh, a nucleotide. Okay, that's one nucleotide. Um, nucleotide. Nucleotides are made up of a sugar, a phosphate, and a base. Now, when we talk about nucleic acids, we're really going to talk about um, DNA. It's our DNA, super important. Anybody know what DNA stands for? Uh, if you remember, Bill Nye, the science guy, maybe that's too old for some people. Um, but DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. 
So what does it mean by uh, deoxyribonucleic acid? Okay. Uh, so deoxy, since it has a sugar, a phosphate, and a base, deoxy is just a type of sugar. So we can see on this image, we have the sugars down here. We have a deoxyribose sugar and a ribose sugar. Uh, deoxy is without oxygen. So the main difference between those two sugars is that this one on the bottom has an H and this one has an OH. What's the difference? That, oh, the oxygen. So one has oxygen, one does not. So DNA is deoxyribose. So it doesn't have the oxygen. Again, it has a phosphate and then has a base. RNA, so this is um, DNA. DNA. Then we have what's called RNA, and that just means ribonucleic acid. It does have the oxygen. It's the biggest difference between DNA and RNA. So remember, DNA is the original, RNA is our copy, the copy that we're going to send out. So we have different types of, of RNAs um, that we'll, we'll talk about right now. And these are our bases on the top. We have cytosine, thymine, uracil, adenine, and guanine. So we have um, our DNA is going to have bases of cytosine, guanine, adenine, thymine. Okay, so those are the four bases. Again, it's just uh, they, they code differently. They have uh, different functions. Okay, so our four bases, RNA, is going to be very similar. It's going to have cytosine, it's going to have guanine, um, it's going to have adenine, but it's going to have uracil. Okay, and it's going to have uracil instead of thymine. It has a U in it, so it just replaces it. Uh, why? Because later on the amino acid sequences or the, the structure of the amino acids um, are going to be read by using the U, the uracil. Instead of uh, instead of the T, okay. So here's just the difference you can see the, in the structure. You don't need to memorize any of these um, specific structure or the specifics of each base. Um, just know that those are the five. One of them DNA has four of them. The other one has another four. Or maybe just the difference between T and U. That's what it is. So when you combine, um, let's see if I can highlight here. Actually, I'll use yeah. Okay. So here's our phosphate. Remember, that's one of our, our groups, our functional groups that we talked about. Um, a phosphate group, here's our sugar, and here's our base. So that one thing is going to be a nucleotide. Okay, One nucleotide. And then when you're talking about a whole chain, um, it's a polynucleotide. Okay, So one nucleotide, so our monomer is a nucleotide. Um, polymer is a polynucleotide. Okay, so a chain of nucleotides. That's what it is. So that's how our um, our DNA is made up of that chain of many, many, many nucleotides. Um, right now, we're not going to talk about the the five and the three and that's going to be in the later videos. Which, but at least we need to know that that intro. So here's our whole chain. Again, the, the base, the sugar, and the phosphate, okay? Now, we already talked about that, we talked about that, we talked about that. Um, the four letters, okay? A, C, G, and the U, instead of A, C, G, and the T. So it's just a difference. Oh, also, uh, DNA um, is going to be um, double-stranded, and that helix. And RNA is going to be single stranded. Okay, what does it mean by double stranded? Look at the picture over here on the left. Um, so you got two strands kind of holding up, kind of that alpha, remember in the proteins that we're talking about, remember in the secondary structure. So it has two lines going around. So that's, um, that's what we call double stranded, and RNA only has one. Why does it only have one? Because then the ribosome is going to come in here. And it's gonna read every single letter, so it doesn't need to split it up or bin it up, or read it up, and then put it back together. That's just a lot of work. Um, it has one strand here, it just reads it and starts creating amino acids and amino acids and creating our proteins. Okay, 
guys are double stranded, single stranded, and deoxyribose or the ribose. So I'll go ahead and write those down as well. And then I'm going to talk about them. So we have deoxyribose sugar, remember without the oxygen, and ribose sugar with the oxygen. So those are the two types of sugars that it has. Those are the main differences um, in the two. We have also different types of RNA. Uh, we have what's called the messenger RNA. So it's a copy we make, which is a single strand right here. We have the ribosomal RNA. So it's kind of this big protein uh, with an RNA inside that's going to read the letters of this one over here. And we have the transfer RNA. So this is all made up of RNA and the tRNA. What that one's going to do is going to um, start adding all these. These are the amino acids right here. So it's going to start adting all the amino acids and bringing them in and connecting them and, and creating the correct chain. So we'll talk more about those in, in transcription translation, but uh, that's just the basics of those. Um, and here they are. So here's our mRNA in the middle, this line. Here's our ribosomal RNA, um, the big red ribosome. And here's the tRNA. See how it's bringing those amino acids that are around? Remember how we have storage proteins that have the amino acids? So we're just reading the instructions to connect them and make a chain here on the left. And that's basically how that works. Um, here's a structure of DNA again. Here's our phosphate, here's our sugar, and here's our base. And we have hydrogen bonds in the middle. Remember those weak little hydrogen bonds that we have? And they're also in DNA in order for us to separate it easily and break it apart and, and do what we need to do in order to read it. Okay, and that is it. That is that on proteins and nucleic acids. So if you have questions for free, let me know. Check on the lab, and I'll see you all on Monday office hours if you need to. If not, I'll see you on Wednesday on the class. Adios.